congratulations for uh, holding what we have and being true tribal warriors. Uh, let me tell you about the first time, the first one of the first psychopaths I ever encountered in my life. I was about 12 and I was in the Boy Scouts in Ballymun and we used to have our meetings at St. Papin's Hall, which was a an old Catholic church, a really old Catholic church from like, you know, centuries ago. And it had a parish hall next to it from when Ballymun was a village before it became, you know, what it was. And um, all built up and stuff. And we used to have the scout meetings in there. Now, there was like, you know, I don't, I'm trying to remember, but I remember there was like, there was patrols in the in the scouts, okay? And then there was like, you know, assistant patrol leader and patrol leader, and they were like kids who were uh, who ra who were you know had their their proficiency badges and all that stuff. And I think I was assistant patrol leader. I was very happy because I thought I was like you know doing well and stuff like that. And uh, I was quite innocent as well, very innocent actually. And um, there was one character who came in one day and joined the scouts, and instantaneously. He was promoted to the thing above patrol leader, but beyond patrol leader, there was like group leader. It was like the officer class of the scouts. Now he was about 15 and he was a scumbag. And I knew he was a scumbag the minute he came in because he was delighting in screaming at the kids and torturing them and uh, act, he was just a total bully. But one day we went camping in Brit British Bay in County Wicklow uh, and it was an absolutely disgraceful scout troop. I think it was the 81st was the number. And it was run by a family out of Poppentry. And they were not nice, they were nice people, but they were they, they, they were literally in a pub every night where they left the kids uh, to themselves uh, on the beach. And you know, that's true, we all saw that. And it was horrible. And uh, they never took us anywhere or anything. It was just the social thing and the status and you know, getting with the parish priest, that kind of carry on. And this guy was a friend of theirs that had been brought in and suddenly promoted to this like thing above patrol leader. I don't remember his name, but I remember he was a bully, a nasty bully to all the kids, the, the younger kids. And uh, we were in British Bay and we were sitting around a campfire and he says, does anyone know any jokes? And then all the kids started telling uh, jokes and a lot of them were dirty. And... I, I remembered one I told and it was just like a, a dirty joke when you're 12 year old is like a harmless joke now and I told it and he went you're a dirty bastard aren't you and I was like what and he goes you dirty dirty bastard you dirty dirty bastard and I'm like he, he told me to tell a dirty joke I told one that wasn't even that dirty and he's calling me he, he's now picking on me see what he had done was entrapment he had gaslighted us into telling jokes so he could like find something to pick on us. And he, he was, so every time I passed him for the rest of the scouting trip on British Bay, he'd go, you dirty, dirty bastard. He's a dirty bastard. He is a dirty, dirty bastard. And uh, it caused me to leave the scouts. I found out that the following year, or uh, they had saved up money to go on a, on a jamboree in the Isle of Man. And this guy who was calling me a dirty bastard had stolen all the scout troop money and fucked off to England with it or somewhere. Like £150, which would have been like, you know, about a thousand in the day's money. And uh, so he he was the first psychopath I think I ever met. He told me to tell a dirty joke when I told that he used it as a weapon against me to try and demoralize me. Now... This morning, I watched a TikTok video of the boss, CEO of Pfizer. And he's sitting there talking about the new Needlecraft, which he called 2.1, like it's a, a 1.1, like it's a software, like Gates mentality. That's a software we have to have every year. And he stated nonchalantly in the conversation, well, the first and second ones didn't really do much, if anything at all. Just like nonchalantly, you know, he's talking about, well, the first and two jabs, did, they didn't do any do much, if anything at all. And then the third one was a bit better. And it's like, oh, what a fucking second. What the fuck? Uh, I, 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 that, okay, when this thing was being used by the media to terrorize people, to absolutely have them petrified, 
you have the likes of Puke O'Neill, Professor Puke O'Neill here in Ireland, inside his plastic bubble going, we can go see the flaming lips, gaslighting the nation, uh, with a, a classic academic psychotic. And you are, if you're watching this, that's what you are. That was not normal behavior inside a plastic bubble on TV going, we're going to go, we're going to go, baby, to see the gold. And he knew that the, that, we, that was bullshit, but he was enjoying mocking the audience who were in fits of terror, just like his guitar is posing with his guitar and everything. He was enjoying it. He was enjoying it. because, And then he said something like the vaccine, the first one, the first needle craft will be 80 something percent effective. He said something like that. It wasn't. Now Pfizer saying it doesn't work the first two didn't work how many billions did taxpayers spend on that how many people thought how many so if it doesn't if the first and second didn't work and people died of side effects then the only thing the first and second ones did was murder people what is so difficult about people to get that concept into your head you know that's they murdered as manslaughter at the very least. So all those people, I remember when they first had the the first uh, round of of jabs here in Ireland, they had a, a an RT report of elderly people mostly, well all elderly people in the Helix Theatre in Ballymun in Dublin. Funny enough, ironically, and <clears throat> they were all saying things like, "Now I can hug my granddaughter," which is pathetic anyway. But I can go see my brother in Fisbury. A 15 minute bus ride for fuck's sake. And uh, this kind of thing. And uh, we don't know how many of them got very ill. I have a friend who took one and nearly killed him. Uh, he felt like he said another life force. I know other people that like got very, very ill after the first one. So other to make people ill and to kill them, the first one served no purpose. And now you have the guy who released it onto the market talking about it like, imagine buying a car and you bought a home and it didn't, it, it didn't, get, it didn't drive, get home from the dealership. And then he said, I'll, I'll buy another one, it'll be better. And then he bought another one and it, and, it, and it blew up on the way home, went on far. And then they said to you, well, the first and second car you bought doesn't work, but the third one will. You know, that's, that's, this, is a, this, is, this, this, this has gone beyond gaslighting into a new form of like evil at, at this point. And people are still, you know, okay, we are a watershed now, but this, the media, the pure evil of the media, uh, I told you yesterday that the government here, the, the pandemic agency here, made the announcement calling for mandatory jabs. And it was met with almost universal revulsion, universal revulsion. Uh, even by people who support the government and are fully on board with the whole pandemic thing and everything, they were like, you cannot do this. Under, and even in the rags like the, the moron.ie, journal.ie, the moron.ie, the, the biggest tone of comedy's posts were, uh, hold on a second, you cannot do this. This is on every level. This is immoral, wrong, unethical and illegal. And that was the highest tone. And the second highest come the comment was, the, the, the tinfoil hatters, we laughed at them, but they've all turned out to be telling the truth. So, you know, the watershed is there. We've turned the corner, big time. But this pay, this thing, this this joke, Internet Live, this called Dublin Live, went out and interviewed people on the street. And it was basically the scum of... The, see, they would have interviewed uh, 100 people. They look for the scum of the earth, or the biggest morons. And they will say, they were going... Yes, uh, we think it should be brought in to, sort of, to save the hospitals. Now, they would have deleted all the ones who said, no, it's disgusting, you cannot have that, in, not in Ireland, no way. And um, uh, that, that I was, like I told you, when I was a kid, and the media came up to Ballymun, and uh, they asked us what living here was like, and I said, that's pretty, when I was a kid, I said, that's pretty good, and pretty normal lives. And then they did a, nor a report on TV that night saying, these kids live in a, uh, suffer through a drug-infested ghetto. Of th uh, their uh, their da daily lives are a horror. You know, like, they, 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 the media completely spun it around a different way. And again, this place did it with this Dublin Live thing, did it with these two, these, these idiots on the street, these morons, and uh, made it look like they were the norm. And um, the, the internet is so... The internet newspapers are so sinister. 
They're so unbelievably sinister uh, because they can last forever, as, as Malone said. You know, if, if it was printed in a regular newspaper in the past, that it, it vanished into the archives. If you wanted to find it, you'd have to go to Microfish on a library database or something. Nowadays, something like The Atlantic, which was once a superb magazine, can attack someone like Dr. Malone and it's on the website forever. Well, there's well fact checkers are scrubbing other things that are contradictory to the narrative. It, it I mean the internet news thing is extremely sinister these days, and uh, this fact checker thing is is absolutely the Ministry of Truth from George Orwell's 1984. Absolutely, and uh, the same kind of people like Smyed in 1984 who is boasting about he got to see the Newspeak dictionary before it was released. Uh, they're 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 the ones who are like you know source please. What? I check fact checkers. Snopes doesn't say that. That's what they're like. They're, they're the inner party morons. Uh, they'll be the first to be destroyed, by the way. Because they always just, like, Smyde was the first one to be liquidized. Even though he absolutely adored Big Brother. And and, and, and obsessed over things like the, the latest edition of the Newspeak Dictionary. And was delighted by the idea, eventually we will destroy language completely. And yet they killed him first, because that's the useful idiots. They're always the first. And <clears throat> so anyway... You know, it was just like, here was the guy from Pfizer mocking people, laughing at them. Well, not even laughing at them, just like, you don't matter, I don't care. I don't care the first two didn't work. But the 1.1, the a software upgrade for your, gene, your genes will next year. So when it was announced, when the, when the mandatory flag or kite was flown yesterday by these absolute scumbags in this thing called Method, uh, the most appalling, despicable forms of bureaucratic smides from, you know, inner party members from the Irish civil service and bureaucracy. When it was flown yesterday, of course, all the political parties came out and said, I'm against mandatory. And so did the Prime Minister Taoiseach. Me. I'm against, it was all staged for that reason. But you have like establishment rags, establishment sites are supposed to be funny, like the, the Waterford's Whispers thing, saying things like, oh, Neffet for a laugh yesterday put it, but it was delivery done on Monday morning. You start your Monday morning, you're fucking pissed off at the, the work week ahead. You're commuting to work and you hear that on the radio. It was deliberately done for that reason, to demoralise people. We're dealing with very sick things. Now, if, if you look at my videos, at, at the end of the week they get between ten and 12,000 views. I would say 6,500 going by the stats are based here in Ireland. So six and a half thousand Irish people watch every video that I put out there. And there's always new one coming in. Now, it may not sound like a lot, but those six and a half thousand, unlike your average TV watchers like this, getting those alpha rays, the difference between you guys and someone who watches mainstream video, TV and radio here in Ireland and reads the newspapers is that you have a conviction in your beliefs. You are, have a conviction in your heart that has brought you to me, regardless of all the names that they would call you. They brought you to John Waters. They brought you to Dave Cullen. They brought you to me, on the, uh, regardless if they called you, you know, the names, the absolutely slanderous names that even politicians like that scumbag Trudeau was calling people. And um, you're here. So you have a conviction in your heart. You have a strength to you. And then the same with people around the world. You have, you've, you've ignored all the name callings, or else you don't tell me, but that's okay if you don't tell people you watch my videos. In your own heart, you're, you're fighting a battle in silence against the whole thing. But you have, the, the diff, why we're winning and why we will win is because we have conviction and we're not driven by things like money. I don't get a big fat paycheck from the taxpayers like all the government do, all the bureaucrats and all the, the media does. To, to tell them what the government wants you to believe. I don't get a big fat paycheck from a corporation. I make, look, you see on my videos, they're nearly all demonetized because of my stance. So I get no, demonetized that are extremely limited. So like, you know, if I get a video that gets 15,000 views, I get 25 pence or 25 cents from it. So you see, like, I'm, there's no money in it, you know, but it's con the same reason there's no money in someone who doesn't want to do it in their job and takes uh, slagging off their mates or the boss going, you're not vaccinated? I don't know about, I don't know about that. You know, uh, they don't, there's no financial conviction, but there's, what there's the conviction in their hearts. There's conviction in their hearts for this, okay? And when you have a conviction in your heart, you can survive anything. 
you can survive the worst horrors, hatreds, bigotries, smear campaigns, slanders thrown at you. Because in your heart, you know that you're, you're not, you're telling, where the ones attacking you are slandering, smear campaigning, because that's the way they lie. A smear campaign is, the, is another type of a lie. It's a lie that's, that's, that's sent in a particular manner in order to distract from and create confusion, but it's a lie. If you have conviction in your heart, it goes right over your head. And as John Waters was saying that about the, the, um, the kind of like the, 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 the trendy middle class cyclist who'd walk, cycle past them and, and dope them and, and show, give, show abuse at them because they're on a bicycle and get away real fast. He said they've all stopped. The reason why they stopped is because John has conviction in his heart. They were just parroting and echoing what the media told them. Often celebrities told them what to say. That's not conviction. That's regurgitation. And conviction, a small number of people with conviction will any time overthrow the greatest empire on earth. For instance, you had less than 500 troops took on the British Empire in Dublin in 1916. After a week, they had to surrender. After fighting, they're, they're fighting very bravely. There was two things that happened there. The working class people who saw the, the, the fight and the tactics and saw the, the, the atrocities in, by, that were created by the British Army in reprisals in places like Mount Street, looked at them and said, those men and women have tremendous conviction. And after they... they didn't care the city was wrecked they said look there and when then others were on the shelf when they saw them being executed the leaders went those men died and because they had conviction and then you had and then they said that's that's really amazing and then you had even and the only ones who threw there was a whole story that when the 1916 thing ended the citizens of dublin attacked them by pouring their bedpans on top of them that's not true a certain type did and there's a certain type today that would be going, stay at home, you know, that picture on Twitter. Rainbow flag, preferred pronoun, stay at home, get the vaccine. Those types, they would have been the, the ones of 1916 who did that. Where are they now? Nowhere. Who do we remember the names of? The people, who do we celebrate? Who do we have statues to? The ones who were there in 1916. Right? Because why? They had conviction. They weren't there before a paycheck. They had conviction and conviction ha is a form of magic that has a tremendous tremendous charge and that charge can change people's change realities it can bring down empires it can do anything and that's why our numbers are small and you see it to yourself like oh my god my whole family thinks i'm a nut uh, people at work but you're winning and you will win because you have conviction and when you have that conviction for something that's not dogmatic, remember, we're, we're, we're not here uh, because some guru or some god or some, some text from some religious document said, uh, do, or some political mandate said, do this. We said, oh, no, I'm, I'm not taking an experimental medical treatment. No fucking way. No way. No way. That's conviction. And... One of the things that always struck me about the 19th, this is, the, again, the 1916 rebels in Dublin, how mixed they were, how diverse they were. There were communists, like James, Con like James Conley, and there were people who had fascistic tendencies, like Arthur Griffith. Well, he was later, but they were all there. There, was people, there were people who were on left wing, right wing. There was men, women, there were gay people, like uh, Roger Casement, uh, there, who's, who were part of the whole thing that went down. It was incredible. There was working class. There was Countess Markovich. There was upper class aristocrats there. There were school teachers and plumbers standing side by side saying, enough, enough. This country deserves its freedom from the British Empire. And we've had enough already. Well, you're not going to put our, our men into the Somme to be slaughtered for a king and country. It's not our king and it's not our country they're dying for. And that conviction brought them together and that conviction eventually won the day and uh, over time and there was there was suffering and sadness and pain along the way but the conviction was the thing that remained no matter what 
conviction will never be defeated, ever. Uh, and when when it comes from a place of human decency and and honesty and intelligence rather than a dogmatic approach. So if you have a conviction for communism, it won't work. If you have a conviction for fascism, it won't work. If you have a conviction for your 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 local political party, conservative, liberal, whatever, it won't work. If you have conserv if you have conviction for a religion that's based on a book of rules that's been handed down from a foreign culture or part of the world or anyone or even locally it won't work because that's not that's not a conviction that's dogma that's orthodoxy but when you are brought you can always tell a group that has conviction by its diversity and having met so many of you during last summer when you came to the coffee things the diversity is, is remarkable there's everybody out there and that's because we have conviction. We're not here because we're black, white, Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, Muslim, you know, atheist, conservative, liberal, you know, right wing, left wing, gay, straight. We're not here for that reason, any of those reasons. We're here because we have conviction against the thing that you cannot be imposing a medical experiment upon us. And, you know, a medic on us. We don't want it. We don't want, we want to choose our own. We have no problem with you wanting it. I'm, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. I just don't want this one because I know it's not a vax. But I, I have no problem with people who want to choose that for themselves. That's their own. It's not for me to tell them. That's, but I want the same courtesy extended to us. Leave us alone. That's all we're asked for. Leave us alone and don't punish us for not doing it. That's all we want. We're not looking for the world to be thrown, overthrown. We're not looking for political parties to, be, to overthrow the world. We're not even looking to say, look, I was right after all. I wish I was wrong about this. What, we're, what, we're, what we want is just to be left alone, to make our own medical choices and not be punished for it, or to be made second-class citizens, and that's exactly what happened. And that's why so many people who have taken the jab are on our side now. Because they're saying, oh, hold on a second, you can't be doing this to these people. The corner has been turned. The major no, any, any person who respects another person's right not to take the jab is a decent person. Anyone who attacks us is an animal. That's as far as I, or anyone who thinks, you know, is an animal. You're an animal if you think that, you know, I should be taking this because you say so. Or because it's the, the right thing to do. It's not the right thing to do, it's the approved thing to do. Approval, you know, it's like the old, the old, the old adage, like the people who, who, gra who ratted on and uh, both the people who ratted on, um, what was her name? Oh, could be. The people who ratted on people who were hiding during the Holocaust and the people who gassed people during the Holocaust were following the law. Does that make it the right thing to do? Well, you're, if you're sitting there saying, uh, a mandatory jabs for everyone. You would be back in 1930 saying, you know, final solution for all the Nuremberg ra racial laws. I have no problem with that. No problem. That's that's the legacy you're standing in under. That's the that's the, the that's the conduit that you're following. And then you talk about us doing the right thing. And if Anne Frank, that's what I was thinking. The ones who grasped, squealed on Anne Frank, and the ones who killed Anne Frank when she died of disease inside once you incarcerated Anne Frank we're following the law does that mean that Anne Frank deserved it of course not and we don't deserve it either and we and I am comparing ourselves to the people who went through that I don't give a fuck I mean I'm a half I'm in a half I'm in a half Jewish family of children who are holo, of grandchildren of Holocaust survivors and I, I'm perfectly, and so are they, who are also on my side, perfectly fine with saying, yeah, this is very similar to what went on in Germany in the 1930s. Ne passes, names, a second-class citizen declare. All you have to do is look at Trudeau's comments and those ones who turn around like the, the Holocaust museums and stuff and say things like, uh, it's not comparable. It fucking is. It fucking is comparable. Just like I'm, I've encountered that mentality in some of those people before. I remember back in the day, so I was talking to a Jewish girl and she said, she, I said to me, well, the Americans did the same to the Native Americans. Oh, it wasn't the same thing. Yeah, it was the fucking same thing. It was. The genocide has happened and evil has happened in many countries and many societies like, have done it. Just because one doesn't follow the exact same template of the other doesn't mean it's no less immoral. It's still immoral. It's wrong. 
And uh, this will be looked back on history as a shocking time. People will, you know, there's already books being published by back by people by, by virologists. You know, these are people not, not non psychotic academics called the, the year the world lost its mind about 2021. And that's what this will this will be seen as the great age of madness. And we will look back at this the same way we look back at things like eugenics and the witch the witch trials and stuff like that. The the persecution, the, the, the sectarian persecutions during the Reformation. We the the Albanesians said, yeah, we will look back on this the same way. And they will they will say the same thing. Yet there was actually this guy called Fauci in America who said that herd immunity doesn't work. And only vaccine, and the first needle craft will work. The first jab will work. The first jab will work. And 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 there's a guy who wanted to ban interstate travel, like they did here in Ireland. We had intercounty travel bans. It all produced nothing. The lockdowns were a complete failure. All the social distancing were a complete failure. There are now there are now thousands of restaurants and pubs in Ireland that are not bothering to open because they're just saying, you know what, fuck it. I'm not going to open, reopen. And they're all closed because of these, these, these ridiculous laws put out by the same people that demanded ma- who, who put out demanded mandatory jabs yesterday. They've, this is the, we have won. We have turned the majority of people on our side. And right now, the political establishments in Ireland, UK and the United States are in absolute states of terror. They're absolutely, like I said, the psychopaths last, last rolled the dice is to do something outrageous. Do something, you know, there's a classic story, I wrote, a, I covered it in my book, Puzzling People. John List was, um, now this is, this, is, this is a classic, this is what we're dealing with now. John List was a, a New Jersey white-collar worker who had a family, th- three kids and a wife. And on the surface was Mr. Suburbia, New Jersey. He commuted every day to his, to his office in Manhattan, uh, on you know, by railway, by train, railroad, commuter train, and one day he didn't, he was fired. Now he could not go back to his suburbia world to decide, you know, to tell, confront his family and say, "I've lost my job. We don't can't live in this fancy house anymore, or anything like that." So he continued to commute every day to Manhattan and feed the pigeons in the park, and then come home at five o'clock to pretending he had a job. And while he sat there in the park, he devised a plan of how he was going to get out of it. He was going to murder his wife and kids and vanish into America. And so one day he came home and murdered his wife and kids in cold, vicious blood. Put their bodies in the basement, turned the heating off so they wouldn't, uh, the bodies wouldn't decay as fast. And covered them in plastic so they wouldn't, would, the smell would take a long time to come out changed his clothes, changed his image, locked the door behind him and vanished into America with a different name. And how he was caught was years later was a show called America's Most Wanted where they had a facial reconstruction of how he would look now in a model made by an artist. And a woman was going, that's the guy living next door. And it was him under a new name. He was living in Colorado or somewhere like that. But that's what that was yesterday. That was their John List moment. It was like instead of it, instead of saying, we instead of Neffet saying we got the the lockdowns wrong, we got all the 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 the, the jabs wrong. It doesn't work. Nothing works. The only thing that worked was herd immunity. The ones who are not needle craft, they're not dying. I'm not that. I don't. I don't know anyone. And I know at this point through these videos and talking to people, hundreds and hundreds of people who have not gotten the jab and have not died. Hundreds I'm talking about, not died. They haven't even been sent to hospital. Not one. Not one. Okay? Uh, there probably could be some, but I don't know them, right? They haven't come up, they haven't admitted it to me. Compare that to the people I know that got the job, and so many of them ended up in hospital or injuries, terrible stroke problems with uh, everything from loss of going blind to uh, to blood clots that are and, and this thing is a DNA thing that if they've got the third one, it's probably irreversible. That's why the Pfizer guy said the, the third one seemed to have done it because the third one is the irreversible one. It's almost like the, the MRA parts of the one and two. In fact, they are because I kind of read up on it and that was kind of what it said. The MRA parts of the one and two were like uh, 
getting ready for number three, the, the, the foghorn leghorn. And the foghorn leghorn, once you had that, you, were, you went through the point of no return. You were, you were gone. And you are probably going to not live much longer. And then you had this guy, Bob Saget, the guy who's been a terrible sitcom back in the day. And uh, he, uh, he announced on his YouTube channel, I just got the foghorn leghorn. And then the next thing, he's dead. In his hotel room, nobody knows why. And he's, the, the sports people are still collapsing left, right and centre. And now Candace Owen has finally posted today that the, there's the, the gaslighting is so powerful in the media that they even ask the question, why are so many sports people falling down? You're told, you're, told, you're, you're attacked. Just for even qu- asking that question without bringing any kind of... This is what we're up against. And Bill Gates owns so many of these... Uh, and so the pharma company owns so many of these so-called trusted sources that fact checkers tells you to go. Look, we are at watershed in reality here. Unbelievable. I talked about there's been a fracture in reality since 9-11. It's a, these, these are compound fractures now. That are, they're, they're, but they're all being solved and resolved and healed. Okay, they're all being resolved and healed. So, you know, I, I am in absolute awe of people like you guys. Who said, no, no. And at the same time, I don't look down or hate people who, who did it. That, that, that was their freedom of choice. You are the vanguards of liberty. The vanguards of Western democracy. You really, really are. And I'm so, I'm so I can't, you know, it's like there's a speech that Bilbo Baggins gave, gave at his 111th birthday party when he says it, it was it's been a pleasure to spend all these years among the comp, a company of such excellent hobbits well let me tell you since this thing began it's been an absolute pleasure to spend the time among such excellent company of you guys in the tribe because my god i was even talking about timony and jason the other night we, 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 we found we found gold we, you know like we're all so different and we, we all we all have the same conviction and it's like gold it's just like it's like uh, you know I really feel like I'm part of something beautiful for the rest of my life for the re- many years I've got left in this planet I really feel now that I've found a tribe and a bunch of people and, and uh, of conviction that are there forever they're not fly by night wasters or users or, or people who think you're wonderful one minute and, and, and then attack you the next or you know, stab you in the back the next after they've been telling you how much they, they fucking, uh, you know, adore you. There's none of that anymore. I really do feel that the people in my life are the people that deserve to be there. I'm getting all emotional and choked up now. But the people that deserve to be there. And, you know, f- God bless you all. You know, you know, you really are a treasure. Not to me and to the rest of us, but to yourself. Take care and look after yourselves.